Okay, thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me here to report on our results and for bringing us to this wonderful city of Barcelona. Um, today I want to report on one experiment, one of our experiments in Munich, on the fermionic quantum gas microscope experiment. Actually, I just want to highlight uh, Guillaume is giving a poster on the results, and if you want to have more detailed look on it, uh, you should go and see his poster. And then Christian is going to talk about some surprising things we ran into molecular physics on uh, Rydberg macrodimers on Friday, which uh, actually are quite nice, and you can actually see that on this picture that we were able to image directly the molecular wave function of these Rydberg macrodimers in the cold gas experiments, and some other surprises, many more surprises in that experiment. But let me actually turn to what I want to talk about today. It's just one topic, uh, but a very actually profound topic in condensed matter physics. And this has to deal with uh, how basically charges, density effects, impurities interact with the magnetic background. And uh, this has profound implications. And, but let me just set the stage uh, what the system is we're working in. This is actually a beautiful picture of Ted Hench that you might have received on your poster card, on your Christmas cards uh, from Ted. And just to remind you what the beautiful setting we're working in. So we're using the interference of laser beams, not as complicated as this beautiful pattern that we have here. And we load ultra cold atoms into this kind of crystals of light to study their behavior. And I think it's just interesting to remind ourselves we can do this with a few hundreds, up to a few thousands of those particles in quantum gas microscope experiments. And we can do this with quantum spin systems, as we've seen with the Rydberg atoms or spin systems here in the systems directly. But we can directly study the behavior of bosonic or fermionic particle systems. So we directly can access, for example, material science properties. And I think in all this discussion about quantum simulators, quantum computers, it's fair to say that ultra-cold atoms are today the only platform where we can have achieved, we've achieved something like a quantum advantage in looking at problems that cannot be calculated on classical supercomputers. So the problem I want to look at today is this celebrated Fermi-Hubbard model problem. So let me just, oops, remind you again of its properties. Um, oh, should be okay. So we have a spin mixture of spin up and down fermions in a lattice. Uh, they interact repulsively in our case. And if we cool them low enough and if we go to strong interactions at half filling where we have one fermion per lattice site, 50-50 mixture, we know that this model maps onto the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model. And so we very well know actually what happens when you have such a system. This is basically in this phase diagram of the high TC superconductors from a paper by my colleague Bernd Keimer in Stuttgart. This is this zero hole doping diagram where you are here uh, in this undoped regime. You see you have this transition to antiferromagnetic order here. Now you see that all the interesting things, of course, connected to high TC happen over here when you dope the system. So you really want to understand what happens when you bring charge impurities, density impurities into the system, and how do they change the magnetic environment or to what kind of new phases do they lead. A very simple model that can try to capture this is this so-called TJ model, where you have hopping of particles uh, in the environment of holes, you have super exchange going on that leads to this antiferromagnetic coupling. And as we'll see, all my talk will be about two competitions, about the competition of magnetic order in the system, antiferromagnetic order, and hole delocalization. So everything can be understood in that sense. So this, what I want to look at is actually two very simple scenarios. I want to look at the 2D case of an antiferromagnet as it's sketched out here. We want to put holes in it and understand how these holes modify the system. And then we want to also look at this actually with going to do this first in a 1D setting where the physics is even more surprising and even more non-classical than one would have thought and want to actually understand again here what happens if we put holes or excess charge carriers into the system. What happens to these? And these 1D systems are so special that some of our good friends actually have devoted almost their whole life to the physics of these one dimensions and I'll come back to this actually later on through the talk. So let me first set the tools of the trade, how we actually observe those systems. And the quantum gas microscopes have been a wonderful new way of, as you'll see, of really getting first-hand grasp onto the microscopic properties of these systems, seeing these microscopic effects in a very profound new way. So imagine you have a many-body system. This could be our Fermi gas or whatever you have, and you make a measurement uh, on that system, then the wave function will collapse onto one of the configurations, and you're going to see that configuration in the experiment. Now, when you repeat the experiment, prepare psi again, you collapse onto another wave function, and by repeatedly doing that, you can get all kinds of probability distributions of configurations of spins, holes, particles in the system. And out of those distributions, you can actually 
calculate complex objects, non-local correlation functions, for example, that can characterize those phases. So it's really a completely new microscopic view on matter that we have. This is kind of how this works in practice for our first bosonic uh, quantum gas microscopes that we had in Munich, where you see those individual atoms lighting up in the microscope beautifully in this 2D plane that we prepared in the system. We can also manipulate atoms. Uh, we'll not make so much use of that in this talk, one by one, uh, but uh, by and just prepare almost any kind of initial state pattern that you want with actually much better um, resolution than the lattice separation down here to 50 nanometer spatial resolution. So the last years have seen actually a tremendous development of these techniques towards Fermi gases and uh, applying this concept to this Fermi Hubbard model problem. And I'm just listing a few here, and I'd like to, you'll hear actually more, you'll see posters from Marco's group, there's a Vasim's talk on Friday, where for sure you'll see a lot of new exciting results in this field. I want to concentrate on our setting and describe to you how we measure the system and how we probe it and how we can use that to analyze the physics we're looking at. So we can have two types of lattices. We can have a short, short-spaced lattice with 1.5 micrometer in each direction, or a short, long-spaced lattice with 1.15 and uh, twice the lattice spacing in the vertical direction. This is what we call the long-short lattice configuration. And you'll actually see in a second why we like to use this uh, compared to this, because this gives us some detection advantages. Um, in this experiment, you see already that you see all the particles. We have no parity projection in this experiment, so we see faithfully when there's one odd particle, when there's two atoms, when there's zero atoms, but we do not see yet where the spins are, and that's what you really would like to see as well in the experiment. So how can we do that? And we actually do that in this short long space lattice using a controlled stern gerlach separation. So we take a single line, single 1D line that you can see here, and split it into two lines using a double well, uh, using a super lattice configuration uh, in a kind of small stern gerlach experiment. So we have a magnetic field gradient that pulls the spin-up particles to the upper chain and the spin-down particles into the lower detection chain. So these are just used for detection. This is the physics chain. These are just detection chains. Then we image those two lines, but then we know the whole configuration of the system. For example, this, uh, for example, top row, these top two lines were one physical system that was split into two lines, and now you can read off the configuration. A hole, a hole, a spin-down, a spin-up, a spin-down, a spin-up, a spin-down, a spin-down, a spin-up and a double on sitting on the last side. So you get the whole configuration of those particles on the lattice and see everything. And this is kind of what colleagues in quantum Monte Carlo simulations would call kind of a single snapshot of, of the configuration of the system. And that's unique to the Munich experiment that we can do that, that we can see spins and holes uh, in this experiment. So here, for example, we have the case again where we have charge resolved. Remember, when I speak of charge, I actually mean density. Our neutral atoms are, of course, not charged, but that's just the language of the condensed matter physicists when they think of electron systems. So charge resolved, spin unresolved. And if we do the stern gerlach separation, we can then see, for example, beautifully how spin and charge become completely resolved, and you can see all the configurations in the system. So what can you do with that? Well, the first thing you can do, for example, in a 1D chain is look at antiferromagnetic correlations. This is just a simple two-point correlator. So you correlate the spin on site I with the spin on site I plus D, and you see this beautiful antiferromagnetic correlations in the system. So I should contrast these with the ones you've seen already in the Rydberg talk. In the Rydberg talks, we were mainly talking about the Ising model, which has a classical ground state just of the spin up and down, up and down. Here we're talking about the Heisenberg model, which has a much more entangled, highly complex ground state. But nevertheless, we kind of will think of it in this language of up and downs, and that's actually some time to time we do see this up and downs in the experiment. So this is a single snapshot again of this up, down, up, down, up, down configuration. But please keep in mind for the Heisenberg state that we're looking at here, this is actually a very rare contribution to the ground state. This is very seldom like this, but we still like to think of the state in, in this classical way to give us kind of some intuition. So I will stick with this intuitive pattern when I write down, for example, the Heisenberg state. And the first thing I want to explain to you is uh, the phenomenon phenomena of uh, spin-charge separation. And this is actually one of the most profound uh, phenomena we have in condensed matter physics, because in this simple setting, it shows you already very uh, important con concepts in condensed matter physics. So imagine you have this Heisenberg chain, and you violently take out one particle. Or equivalently, I could say, you inject a hole with spin one-half into the system, a positively charged spin one-half hole into the system. Now, what will happen actually when you've removed this or injected your spin one half hole is actually that this hole 
actually can now separate, can move freely through the system, but it leaves behind this spin excitation that we have here. So this is what we call a spin-on, and this is what we call a hole-on. And actually what has happened is that the quantum numbers of the particle of your hole that you're injecting into the system have become fractionalized. The spin and the charge are carried by two new quasi-particles in the system, the spin-on, which carries the spin one-half, and the hole-on, which carries the charge but is spinless. So your original elementary particle fractionalizes in two constituent quasi-particles, and uh, these carry the quantum numbers. So that's a very fundamental concept. And actually, in 1D, in this configuration, you actually see that these two quasi-particles are deconfined. What do we mean by deconfined? Well, they can separate over arbitrary distances. This hole can move as far away as it wants from the spin-on. There's no energy cost in doing so for it. Okay, so that's what we mean by deconfinement of uh, this, and uh, this leads to kind of separation of the spin degrees of freedom from the charge. So that's a violent process, but let's look at what happens if you actually ask, what happens if I put a ground state hole, a dope, a dope my system, and I don't violently take out a hole, I just uh, put it in gently and ask, what is the ground state of the system? And you see you have now the competition between two things. You want the holes, just as any particle in quantum physics to delocalize, which will minimize its kinetic energy, on the other hand, you want the spins to align antiferromagnetically. So you have, again, this competition of kinetic energy and magnetic energy in the system. The way to solve this problem in 1D is actually um, special, is actually to favor a configuration like this, where the hole, the ground state now, is the hole being delocalized over all sides. That minimizes its kinetic energy. And at the same time, those uh, bonds being antiferromagnetically, which minimizes magnetic energy cost. But you see something is different here compared to violently taking out a hole, uh, a particle. Here in this ground state, across a hole, we have antiferromagnetic coupling, whereas here across a hole, we would have ferromagnetic coupling in the system. Okay, so this is the ground state, this would be the excited state of the system. So the microscopic origin of this is the first lesson I want you to learn in this, is if we put a hole in a 1D chain, it's not just a local excitation, if we do it in a doping way, it actually gives rise to a strong collective behavior by which we've removed a particle, but we've actually also shifted the antiferromagnetic order in its sign by minus one. So you think this order is down, up, down, up, and the reversed order is up, down, up, down. Then you see what this hole does. It acts like a domain wall which flips the sign of the antiferromagnetic order. So it's really not a local excitation. It's a collective excitation in the system uh, that also flips, introduces these uh, parity kings in the AFM background. So the number one lesson I want you to, to keep for today, when you put holes in a 1D system, they act like quantum domain walls in real space and shift the whole antiferromagnetic order by pi phase shift. So we can see that. So this is the first actually non-trivial measurement we can do to show in this three-point correlator to do that we can measure something that you cannot measure in condensed matter physics. So this is measuring the spin here, correlated with the spin here at site I plus two, conditioned on having a hole in between. So it's a three-point correlator, uh, something new. And you see when we do this, uh, across this hole or across an undoped system, you see indeed that the antiferromagnetic order around this hole flips, flips by minus one. Uh, in this more complicated graph, we see it's not just the local environment, it's really the whole antiferromagnet shifting its parity by minus one when we'd introduce these holes. So here's, in this complicated plot, let me walk you through that. Here's the distance between the two spins that we're correlating. So we're measuring, again, a spin-spin correlator conditioned on a hole being somewhere. And now this hole can either be in between those two spins, then we get a certain kind of up-down, up-down pattern, or the hole can be beyond the two spins that we're correlating, like this configuration, and then you get this configuration. And you see the only difference here is that in either case, they're shifted by pi phase shift, the whole antiferromagnetic order of the system. Now, what happens now when you put more and more holes into the system? So you go to a really very strongly doped system, and this will bring us to the essence of this spin charge separation in 1D to the fractionalization that occurs, why, why that actually happens is uh, if you put many, many holes into the system, then we know each hole makes a pi phase shift. And if you, if you stare at this picture for a second, you actually see that if you would somehow remove the holes, 
would take them out in an artificial way, then you see you have a perfect anti-ferromagnet back again. So these holes actually have a very simple effect in 1D that they realize a hidden anti-ferromagnet that if in a real lattice you would be able to remove those defects and squeeze the system together to form an undoped system, you would see that the magnetic correlations of the undoped system where you've removed the holes would be just a perfect anti-ferromagnet. This is expressed in an exact mathematical way by the factorization of the many body wave function of our spin system, of our fermions would spin up and down in the lattice uh, where we can now write this in the limit of very large repulsive interactions as a product of spinless fermions defining the positions uh, living on kind of our lattice sites and a magnetic part which drive, describes the antiferromagnetic correlations which lives on a fictitious lattice which is just described by the positions of the particles where the holes have been removed. And this is the essence of spin charge separation in the ground state. You can measure this by actually uh, defining a co correlation function, the so-called string correlator, that correlates the spins on site zero with the spins on site D and takes into account every time there is a hole, this thing counts the hole, every time there's a hole, there is a minus one phase shift in this kind of spin correlator that you get. And with this correlator, with this non-local correlator, you can actually measure kind of the spin correlations in the system. And let me just put that into context because this really uh, is a fundamental thing uh, if we think about how we define order parameters in nature. If you find how we classify quantum phases in nature, it's typically we have two, an, uh, two observable, an observable A measured at points X and Y, which goes to uh, a constant value at very, very large distances. So for example, in a ferromagnet, if you tell me how the ferromagnet is pointing here, you know how it's pointing everywhere. If you know the condensate wave function here, you know what it looks like somewhere else in the system. So these are examples of local order parameters, but we now know, of course, that nature is much more kind of interesting than that. It hosts a lot of these non-local order parameters, which can only be revealed if you have a global view on the many-body systems. What do I mean by global view? By global view, I mean it's not only uh, sufficient to measure the observables at point X and Y, you need to measure a observable B, for example, on all the sites in between X and Y to reveal this non-trivial correlations. And for a long time, our theory colleagues, colleagues have called these order parameters hidden order parameters because nobody ever thought that they could ever be measured in an experiment. So let me show you that this actually works. So let's take a highly doped system, 1D system, a lot of holes in it, and if I just measure the two-point correlations, well, if the, if the spins sit right next to each other, they will be antiferromagnetically aligned. But beyond that, there can be an arbitrary number of holes in between them, and you see that leads basically to a zero two-point correlator. So this is what a condensed matter physicist physicists, for example, would measure with neutron scattering. And then you would say, okay, there is no magnetic order in the system. But if I remove the holes, if I evaluate this string correlator, you can actually see that we can recover these antiferromagnetic correlations in the system. We can reveal this hidden magnetism that is present in this system. So let me just uh, touch upon some new results now uh, and turn on how actually this holes, how they are placed in the lattice is much more subtle than at first sight what I've explained to you. And this goes back to the celebrated Luttinger liquid theory invented again by Duncan Haldane that we use today to describe many of these, these 1D systems in a very efficient way. So what this predicts, this Luttinger liquid theory, is that these holes that you can insert into the 1D systems actually not just randomly orient themselves, position themselves, but they do it in a way that the wave vector of the antiferromagnetic order is stretched as you dope the system. And this is not only when you dope the system, but also when you magnetize the system. The same thing happens when you put in excess spins or holes. In both cases, this predicts that you should have a stretching of the antiferromagnetic wave vector with respect to the underlying lattice. And uh, this is challenging for experiments. Why? Because you need to work at very precise densities and very precise magnetizations in the system. And that's not, easy, not so easy because if you look at typical statistics over our experiments, uh, we can count every atom, we can count every spin, so I know in every shot what the spin magnetization atoms are, but there's a fair good distribution of them. And if we would just average over all those distributions, just take the data as it comes, we would never be able to see that. But here's the power, because we see everything. We see the magnetization down to the level of single individual spins, the atoms down to the level of single individual atoms, I can post-select my data and say, okay, I just analyzed the data which falls into the zero magnetization category, for example. And then I can check 
and at a certain density. And then I can check precisely this prediction. This is what we've done. Here's density doping and looking at the antiferromagnetic order in the system. And you immediately see, if we just look at the raw data already, the spin-spin correlation, how this is stretched as we dope the system. If we fully transform the data, you indeed beautifully see this linear wave vector change upon doping of the system. The same happens with uh, uh, magnetizing the system. So if we magnetize the system, you also see when we Fourier transform the data, you see this nice linear excitation branches. And if we fit the wave vector of this incommensurate magnet to our data, we find like excellent agreement to within a few percent um, with, the, with the experiment. Okay, let me actually um, just show you these, these pictures, these final pictures. So we have actually, these are kind of single snapshots of exactly the effects I've shown you before. The whole acting like a parity domain wall shift, or the spin on here, these two spin ups, acting like a parity domain wall shift leading to this stretching of the wave vector. Let me just in the final minutes come to, to effect now in 2D. Now in 2D things is very different because if you go into 2D, you see you put an extra charge carrier in here and now as it moves across the lattice, it will leave behind a string of flip spins and now will leave ferromagnetic order behind and this costs energy. So this charge now cannot move freely anymore through the 2D lattice because there's magnetic energy cost in the system. So what can you do? You can either reduce the overall antiferromagnetic background or in a local region around your defect, you can modify the magnetic background to create a more favorable environment for this particle to move, to create reduced AFM correlations or ferromagnetic correlations in this bag. And uh, this has been worked out by several people. You can kind of think of this in the limit, actually, of very strong repulsive interactions, very large tunneling over spin exchange interaction. Uh, this even a single impurity can turn the whole system ferromagnetic. This is called Nagaoka ferromagnetism, where this antiferromagnet would turn ferromagnetic. So let me just show you that we can measure this in, in the 2D setting. So here's the charge defect, the doublon. And we're measuring different spin correlators around it. And already on this first picture, you can see how the antiferromagnetic bonds are weakened. So this is the co spin correlator between this side and this side, conditioned on having a hole here. This is the correlator between this side and this side, conditioned having a hole here. Uh, you can see already that in the center region, this is kind of uh, weakened, this antiferromagnetic order. Actually, for the diagonal correlators, the sign is even flipped compared to the background value that we have. And uh, in the C2 correlators, we see the same thing of this weakened correlations around this hole. So let me just finish with this and say that we now have a complete map of the model independent uh, polaron image of a polaron, magnetic form polaron forming around these charged effects, which gives us a completely new handle on looking at this interplay of charge and spin in, in the system. There are many, many things in the outlook one could, could say, but since I'm time out of time, I should just mention the people who did the work. This was mainly Guillaume Salomon who worked on the experiment, uh, Timon and Yanis as PhD students who were the primary workers, and of course our theory colleagues, Eugene Demler and Fabian Kost. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.